Photographic technology has changed a lot in the last century. Digital photography became cheap and convenient because of the CCD, the charge coupled device inside this camera. In the past, we just place a piece of film here behind the lens. But now we have a purely electronic imager to do all the work. Let me show you. Here it is, just a shiny slab. Yet its details are fascinating. 
This CCD captures the image and then transfers it to the camera's memory system to record it as electronic data. When exposed to light, different sections of the CCD build up charge proportional to the light's intensity. We can then measure that charge and know precisely how bright that section of the image should be. If you enlarge a picture on your computer, you can easily see the tiny picture elements called pixels. Each one corresponds to a single section of the CCD. This is the essence of the digital camera. Several million of these sections of photosensitive silicon in a grid capturing an image. Now, the key to understanding how digital photography became cheap and ubiquitous lies in the ingenious way that the CCD transfers the image into the camera's memory. The easiest and most straightforward way would be to use wires to connect each pixel in an XY grid. But that presents a problem. Here's what goes wrong. After exposing the grid to light, we can use these wires to read the information pixel by pixel, measuring the charge on each section of the grid. This makes sense in principle, except all of the pixels and their electronic components leak a small bit of charge that distorts the charge coming from each pixel and leads to striations and patterns in the image. This distortion, called capacitive coupling, increases as the number of pixels increases. A CCD solves this problem in a very simple way. The pixels have no wires attached to them. A CCD is made from a slab of silicon. To make each pixel within the slab, engineers create insulating sections called channel stops. These divide the slab into rows. The surface is covered with a thin layer of insulating silicon dioxide, and then perpendicular to the channel stops, engineers deposit thin strips of metal, typically aluminum. Each pixel then is one section bounded by channel stops and aluminum. So now we have our grid of pixels. Recall that when light strikes the whole array, the silicon pixels build up charge proportional to the intensity of the light striking them. We then have a captured image stored as charge within each pixel. The great innovation of the CCD was how it moved the image from the silicon array to the camera's memory system without using external wires that would distort the image. The CCD shifts the charges from row to row without wires until they reach the bottom when a readout register transfers the charge to the camera's memory with very little distortion. The camera then counts the charges and constructs the image using that data. Now, one last important question. How do we get color? A CCD only detects total light intensity, which is useful for producing a black and white image. But for a color photograph, we need to separate the entering light into red, green, and blue. The most obvious solution is to filter the light into those three colors using three separate CCDs to capture red, blue, and green information and combine them into a full color image. However, engineers have created a cheaper solution. Instead of using three separate CCDs, they use a little math so they only need one. In this consumer camera, they cover that single CCD with a filter with red, green, and blue pixel size sections. This creates an image coming out of the CCD that's a mosaic of these three colors. The camera applies an algorithm to estimate the correct colors for each pixel. For example, if a green filter covered a pixel, we would need to estimate the red and blue components of that pixel. To do this, they'd use the adjacent pixels and average the color intensity for the pixels in question. It works because the image's significant details are much larger than each pixel. This sounds implausible, but you've seen the results yourself. I'm Bill Hammack, The Engineer Guy. This video is based on a chapter in the book, Eight Amazing Engineering Stories. The chapter features more information about this subject. Learn more about the book at the address below. Okay, so I hope with that video, with that explanation videos, you guys can get or you guys will have a better understanding of how charge couple device works. Right? Okay, now before we go further into digital video, let us look at some of the item or some of the term or device that we use to transfer video using analog transfer method. Okay, there are, there are several ways to send video using analog method okay, such as the first one is component video okay, component video it will separate color and brightness over three cables okay, I believe you can see the image here okay then you can see uh, on my back okay the example of component video okay it will it have three cables okay and it will separate between color and brightness Okay, so this is one of the way of the analog way how we can transfer video okay the second one the second one is 
S video and in this S video color and brightness will be transferred over two wires and over two wires I believe the old version of laptop okay basically we do have this kind of jack at the side of our laptop okay every laptop okay maybe then maybe in the last uh, 10 years maybe okay we every laptop must have this jack on this side of the laptop but nowadays we are not use this anymore we have transfer or we have moved into the digital way of transfer <coughs> transfer all the videos okay the third way is composite video composite video transmit <coughs> the whole video signal in a single cable I believe uh, this <coughs> this video you, most of you guys used to found this cable okay the white red and yellow okay there are three cables yeah there, there are three cables but they only use one cable to transfer the video okay do you know which one is it like between the three colors white red and yellow which one that they use to transfer the video try to guess yes you are right okay we are using the yellow cable so that's why if you are still using this uh, cable this composite video i believe uh, during my time when i play uh, playstation 2 okay playstation 2 i still use the composite video okay so the yellow color or the, the yellow cable will only tra transmit the video so and some of the old decoder okay also use this composite video so if we want to connect from our television and our decoder we just need to connect the uh, if you want to or if you want only to transfer the video from the decoder to the television we only need to connect the yellow cable from our decoder to our television and the remaining two which is white and red it's for audio cable so if you do have uh, so for example if you have the uh, home theater or sound system at your home and you are using and, and if you are using this component video meaning that the yellow cable will connect from your decoder and your television and the two remaining cable which is white and red will connect from your decoder to your sound system right okay so next yeah, the analog video so the analog video when we're talking about the analog video okay video is recorded onto magnetic tapes eh? it will record it onto magnetic tapes this is the the era of we are when we are, when we are using the vcr player or when we are using the uh, cassette player i'm not sure whether you guys have the opportunity to use this or not and the cassette player and the video uh, vcr player okay so this is uh, we are using the magnetic tapes on it okay uh, on the device or on the tape okay next i will tell you about the analog display standard there are several standards that can be used okay the first one is a national television standard committee okay or, the, uh, or we call it as a ntsc the second one is a pal pal for phase alternate line and the second and the last one is sequential color and memory or we call it second and the difference between this standard is the horizontal or the, the screen resolution and the horizontal scan line i believe if you can if you're referring to your slides okay you can see between these three analog standard you can see the difference between the standard is on the screen resolution and the horizontal scan lines okay and, and yes now you can see okay on my back you can see the difference between the NTSC view and the PAL view. Okay, so this there, there's, there's some difference between these two. Okay, have a look at it. Okay, next we will cover the digital video part. 
and yeah, we have finished about the analog. So now we have moved to the digital video. In digital video, the output is digitized by the camera into a single a sequence of single frame. A sequence of single frame. And the video and the audio data are compressed and uh, being uh, before being written to the tape or digitally stored. And so it will be compressed before it will return such as on the CD okay, or digitally stored and there are multiple HDT format exist and the, and the resolution and frame are vary okay, so the aspect ratio in HDTV in the high definition television is 16 over 9 eh? 16 over 9 so this is the HDTV this is a, it's a, it different if you want to see or if you want to know which one is 16 over 9 or 16 or uh, 4 over 3 okay the 16 or uh, over 9 is the white screen okay? it's the white screen just like your laptop screen and for 4 3 the example of 4 over 3 is if you ever connect your laptop with your projector sometimes when you connect your laptop with your projector and normally nowadays the projector are still using the 4 3 resolution and 4 3 just like a square and then 69 is about the wide screen right so if you're using the <coughs> the 4 over 3 uh, from the projector and you connect to your laptop sometimes you will see your the display on your laptop okay will be shrink the the, the the side on the left and the right of your screen laptop okay will be black so that uh, it, it means that the projector that you connect that you connect your uh, with your uh, laptop is 4 over 3 and your laptop is 16 over 9 so it will follow the projector resolution okay still uh, referring to the slide now we are at this CRT and LCD display huh. CRT display I haven't seen this kind, this kind of monitor for very very long time okay and in this display interlacing and progressive scan technologies and most computer video output is now way right, greater than uh, 1024 times 678 and this is quite old and eh? this is quite old uh, resolution but now on your laptop especially the resolution is far greater than that and it almost <coughs> it almost quite uh, more than 2000 times 1000 plus okay next how are we going to obtain a video clip to be inserted in our project? Okay, there are several ways. Okay, the first one is either we can shoot it for ourselves. Okay, we need a new footage, or we just use a stock footage. So this, so this is a two ways to obtain a video clip. The first one is to shoot yourself for a new footage, and the second one is just get a stock footage from internet, such as YouTube or Google. So, when you want to shoot and to edit your, your video, okay, the first thing that you need to have is a shooting platform. Okay, a steady shooting platform should always be used. In order to shoot or to edit your video, okay, I'm talking about the, the first one is about shooting. So, if you want to shoot or when you want to shoot your video, okay, make sure you have your shooting platform. Okay, there are so many ways to make your camera steady okay, one of the method that can be used is your, you can use a tripod okay, you can use a tripod just to make sure that your camera are still at one place and if you are moving eh, from here and then you want to shoot okay, maybe you can consider to use a device such as a gimbal a gimbal all right so okay this is the example of gimbal okay if you can use this to just to uh, make sure that your camera is stable right? because it's uh, also we call it as, uh, also a, as a stabilizer okay so the one that i use right now is a uh, uh, zoom smooth 4 okay so it will help you to stabilize your camera 
Okay, I will show you. Okay, in some of the video about this, how to use this, this gimbal and what we can do with this item. All right, so check it out. When I got into filmmaking about 12 or 13 years ago with a little camcorder, I never would have thought I would end up shooting proper footage with a phone like this or even have an electronic stabilizer like this one. But here am I today reviewing the Xeon Smooth 4, which is their latest gimbal that can not only stabilize your shaky phone footage, but it can rather enable you to shoot cinematic footage. You have a few cool features such as focus pulling, you can zoom, and you can also create a nice dramatic vertigo effect. On the front side of the grip are different buttons, such as the record button. Switching between pan, following mode and locking mode is very easy and done quickly thanks to the switch at the front. Most gimbals require you to press a mode button a certain amount of times to change between modes, which can be confusing at times, so it's good to see Sion simplify the mode change. The focus mode is one of the most impressive things, usually professional cameras have that. You can manually pull focus, most phones cannot do it, but if you use the Xeon app in connection with the gimbal, it works pretty well. So you can actually just turn this little wheel, just like a professional focus puller, and yeah, then you can change, for example, between fore and background, but it works and it's pretty cool. The other thing you can do with the same wheel by pressing the target button down here is you can switch to zoom mode which is also useful if you want to zoom you can also adjust the speed depending on how fast you actually turn this little wheel so that is pretty useful it also depends how good the connection is so sometimes it works better sometimes it works less good but i think overall it's pretty cool to have that there is a loss of quality depending on your phone's camera it's still pretty amazing because even if you zoom in and you walk around with the gimbal it's still pretty steady and pretty stabilized The so-called phone go mode is probably the most useful motion feature because it's something I end up using all of the time. The phone's movement is locked, which means you can move the gimbal however you want to without any delay. This especially comes in handy when walking fast and also needing the camera to move very quickly. What I think makes this gimbal especially usable for pretty much everyone is that you don't have to tap on the screen to change any kind of option. You have most buttons here which can access pretty much every menu, every setting. So the last thing you want to do is when shooting a vlog is tap on the screen, right? It's going to destabilize the camera. It's not going to look nice. So if you want to stop or start recording, you can press here. If you want to change your exposure, you can do it as well. So it's pretty cool that you have all buttons, all options accessible right here on the grid. The vertigo effect is a dramatic tracking shot in which the camera moves towards a subject and zooms out at the same time or the camera moves away from a person or subject and zooms in. We used this effect in the past on different commercial and time-lapse productions and it's a great way to improve the cinematic quality of a video. The effect can be done manually or can be set up in the ZY Play app. The internal battery of the gimbal lasts for around 10 to 12 hours depending on the shooting mode and can be charged via USB Type-C. I have tested this Smooth 4 for about a week now and I have to say overall it works very well. Of course the quality, the result also depends on which phone you are using. I tried the latest iPhone and Samsung Galaxy and overall I have to say I'm pretty impressed. The stabilization always works, you don't need the app for that, but of course if you want to use the app which enables all the features such as the focus pulling, zooming or also the vertigo effect. So make sure if your phone is actually compatible with the app um, otherwise, maybe you cannot use all features. Even though the Smooth 4 is a gimbal, it's much more of a tool that turns your phone into a proper camera. 
Of course, the video quality is limited by how good the phone's camera is, but it's impressive to see how far technology has come in the past decade. So you have watched that video, and you have watched the video about gimbal, and other than that, so what can assist you in order to help you to get a good features or good footage? Okay, you you can also you can always use a, a use an external microphone for a better uh, quality of audio, and of course you need to know the features of your camera and software. So whatever camera that you use to shoot your video. Either DSLR or you will just use your video cam, or maybe you just use your mobile phone. And but and believe me, mobile phone nowadays okay, have a tremendous features okay, uh, to help us to get a good quality of raw material to be edited later. And again, when you want to shoot, before you want to shoot, okay, you must decide on the aspect ratio up front. Okay, what does it mean by aspect ratio? Meaning that you need to decide what kind of ratio that you want to use. What is aspect ratio? In regards to movies, aspect ratio is the proportional relationship between the height and width of the image that you see on screen. But perhaps the more important question is why? Why do some films look like this while others look like this? Today, most films are presented in either 185 to 1 or 235 to 1. These widescreen formats became popular in the 50s. Before then, most films were shot in 137 to 1, also known as the Academy Ratio. Nowadays, filmmakers can pretty much shoot their films in any aspect ratio they want. Some filmmakers choose an aspect ratio based on the time period that their film takes place. Others find an aspect ratio that they love and stick with it. For example, David Fincher shoots exclusively in 235 to 1, which accommodates his sleek cinematography and wide environments. On the other side of that spectrum, Andrea Arnold prefers older, boxier formats to create claustrophobic worlds. The aspect ratio tells you more about a film than you may think. A ghost story, for example, is shot in a cramped 133 to 1. This expresses how the main character feels trapped and we feel the same way. What's really interesting about this particular film is how the corners of the frame are rounded. Invoking the nostalgia of an old photograph, this makes the film feel like a memory. The Hateful Eight was shot in the ultra-wide 276 to 1. Not only does this complement the beauty of the snowy vistas, it also enhances the feelings of paranoia and uneasiness once we get inside the house. A growing trend in filmmaking is the use of multiple aspect ratios throughout a single film. Sometimes, this is done to distinguish different time periods. Other times, it's due to switching between IMAX and standard cameras. But the most interesting cases are when the change is done to create a feeling. The change can be done in a very obvious and self-aware fashion, like in Xavier Dolan's Mommy, where the character literally stretches the screen. The expansion feels like a breath of fresh air as we break confinement. We feel the same release that the character does. Or the change can be extremely subtle, like in Trey Edward Schultz's It Comes at Night. The film is shot in 235 to 1, with 275 to 1 reserved for nightmare sequences. As the film reaches its dreadful conclusion, the screen slowly and painfully closes in on itself until we reach 3 to 1, which equates to watching the film through a tiny slit. The transition is so subtle that you probably don't even notice it, but you surely feel it. Reality has now become the nightmare. Though it often goes unnoticed, Aspect ratio is a crucial element of visual storytelling. Okay, next. So what are the things that can assist you to produce a good raw material when you're shooting? Okay, the thing is uh, you need to always strive for adequate lighting. So you must have enough light when you want to shoot your raw material okay either is it outdoor or indoor if outdoor maybe you can shoot it um, when the time um, you have a good sunlight 
get a clear sunlight to assist you to get a natural light or if you shoot inside an indoor like in a room so please make sure you get the and you can like by maybe you have to purchase like an extra light okay like the one that i did right uh, that i use right now is i'm using a led ring light okay if you can look at the uh, my glasses okay they are uh, reflect uh, my, my led ring light or reflected okay on my glasses all right so yeah, that's it so this is important okay, why this is important because we don't want or we try to avoid the shadow okay? the shadowing uh, or the lighting are not fully covered uh, to the object that you want to record okay after lighting okay now i want you i want you to know okay some of other things that will help you in order to produce a successful video what is it okay what is it okay it is a planning so successful video production requires planning so how are we going to the to going to to execute our planning our, our plan what we want to shoot where we want to shoot who will be involved in the shooting okay one of the method is through storyboarding okay we will need a storyboard in order for us to know to decide what we want to do first what we want to do next and so on man this is important especially like us okay, we are amateur we don't have any we don't have enough experience uh, in shooting a video for those who have more experience okay maybe they don't they do not need this story mode uh, at all because they have the experience and they know what to do and what kind of angle they want to shoot what kind of aspect ratio that they want to use but for us uh, as an amateur we need this storyboard so that we will know okay the first thing we want to do this the second thing third fourth and so on so it will make things easier for us to execute our shooting okay this storyboard i can say it's sort of a, a roadmap or a blueprint for our shooting so when we want to shoot actually we just executing what has been planned what has been decided in the storyboard Hi guys, it's Gary here from Acme and today we're going to talk about storyboards. So, what is a storyboard? Well, glad you asked. A storyboard is a guide of how a film is going to look, a way of visualising all the shots in a film before you actually go out and capture your footage. And they're kind of like a comic book, but not. The panels in storyboards are usually rectangular and that's because they represent the camera frame. A storyboard is usually created using a shot list and a shot list breaks down all the information found in a script into a list of, yep, you guessed it, camera shots. A storyboard is a way of illustrating what those shots will look like and everything that will be in the camera frame when that shot is finally filmed. You should illustrate where things like your characters, objects, superheroes are in relation to one another and the setting they're in. You'll also need to work out what shot type you'll use to cover the action and the emotion you want. So are you going to use a long shot, a close up, an extreme close up? In this sequence from Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull, we see a long shot to show us the setting and our characters within that setting, then a close up to show us the panic on their faces just before Indy gets pulled off a moving motorbike and into a car. <laughs> As your storyboards get more advanced, you can use arrows to indicate how or where a character is moving, as well as camera movements such as panning, tilting. You don't have to be a fantastic illustrator to make storyboards. The reason why storyboards are so important is because once you're out there filming your masterpiece, you're not going to be making everything up as you go. And when you're filming, there is so much going on, so if you have a visual plan for each shot of the film, you'll save time, and avoid a stressful situation. Okay, okay. okay, next, okay, about chroma key. Okay, about chroma key. So this chroma key it refers to a blue screen or chroma key editing is used to superimpose subject over different background 
Okay, in fact, right now, okay, I'm using a green screen to shoot this video. Okay, we are on my back actually. I do have a green paper, a green paper, green color, a green Manila card. Manila card. Okay, I put it on my back and on the wall, and then I shoot this video. So when I use this green screen, eh, uh, I can change or I can take out all of my background, and I can change it with anything that I want. Okay, either whether it's a video, image, or anything, uh, or anything. Right, so and remember when you want to do this green screen, okay, you need to make sure that your outfit okay does does not have or does not contain any green colors, okay, any green color. Or if you do that, okay, you will realize when you taking out all this background behind of me and to change with uh, some other background, okay, the part that have a green color on you also will vanish right just like a hollow man right so and remember our green screen this is a great way eh, for you guys to try eh, because it will help you to do so many things and, and it is interesting things to try and remember okay again i advise you please make sure you don't have any green colors on your shirt eh, or anything that you wear Okay, and right now, okay, so, so before that, now I want to show you, okay? So this is the, right now, I have, I, I have take all the background, the, the, green, the green background, and I change it with something else, okay? And, okay, hold, okay, now, see, this is the real, okay, this is the real background before I using, before I use, uh, before I use, Chroma key. Oh, so, so this is it. Eh? You can see the uh, green paper uh, behind uh, behind me. And okay. And now, three, two, one. See, I have take out. I have taken out all the green screen and I change it with something else. Okay. Remember, please make sure you don't have any green colors on your shirt or anything that you wear when you want to create a chroma key effect okay or else okay i'm about to take one manila card okay the green color the same color like uh, like i use uh, on my back okay i i will put it on my chest and you will see the difference my body will gone see that only my head see only my head you can only see my head because I already put a green paper in front of me. See? Uh, the hanging. Uh, the hanging head. See? Ha <laughs> Right? Mm. Okay. See, this is my shirt. And now you can see. See? Ha <laughs> ah, There you go. Okay, so please make sure you don't have any green colors any green things on your shirt or anything that you wear now let's talk about composition eh? composition so consider the delivery medium when composing short eh? meaning that you need to consider when you want to deliver in the medium you need to decide what are the composing shot that you want to use okay such as a close-up or and please use a medium shot when possible okay again Okay, move the subject, not the lens. Okay, unless if you are using uh, a stabilizer or a gimbal, then it is okay. But if you are using your hand, just hold your device such as your mobile phone, then you just hold it on your hand. So most probably the the phone the, the, the image will be shaky. Okay, even though in uh, in high end linear software high-end editing linear such as premiere we do have a stabilizer to stabilize the image but if we can get the real or the raw material the unshaky one okay it's much more better okay? and again uh, beware of backlighting okay? beware of backlighting meaning that you need to face the light Okay, you don't put your back to the light and record from uh, in front of you so you're going to get a back lighting and one of the most important part is adjust the white balance okay for those who always or 
have a DSLR, okay, they will know what is what are the importance of adjusting the white balance. Okay, it is for for you guys to get a true color out of from the object that you shot. Okay, true color. So that's why you need to adjust the white balance. Okay, talking about title and text. Okay, in your video, please use plain sensory font that are easy to read. Okay, easy to read. Why? Because remember, what are the purpose you are putting text in your video? What are the purpose? What are the main purpose? Of course, for people to read. So just use a plain sensory font that are easy to read and choose the color wisely yeah? choose the color wisely make sure it is contrast with your background if you have a dark background please use a clear right? like, like your, you have a, a black background use a white font if you have a, a bright, bright background use a dark color such as black or blue and hey, look at my shirt and hey, look at my shirt Just, uh, I, i'm wearing a black t-shirt so all the word on my shirt i use a white color so it will contrast oil and it will pop up and clearly um, again next is provide an ample space for your text make sure it is easy to read and give an ample space for the text uh, don't put it too crowded uh, in your screen and when we and when you creating a title on screen make sure you leave the title on screen long enough so, so that they, so that they can be read by your audience remember when we're talking about titles and text on video because we want people to read okay don't just insert the text and then take it out after one second people might not have the chance to read your text and and keep it simple and keep it simple you don't have to put 10 lines of text on your screen just to tell what is happening on your video uh, keep it simple uh, just like one or two words uh, or just, uh, just uh, if you want to give a sentence in your video make it simple okay now we are gonna move into non-linear editing and the non-linear editing the high-end software has a steep learning curve and it's not easy but also it's not impossible such as Adobe Premiere and uh, Final Cut Pro, uh, Sony Vegas you don't have to read about all this uh, high-end uh, software because the, 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 the tutorial there are, there are so many tutorials that you can find eh, on YouTube okay, you, you just name what you, you just name it you just find a keyword what you want to do with that uh, application such as uh, to uh, uh, Adobe Premiere Slow Motion, okay. What else? Uh, Final Cut Pro, uh, Chroma Key. Uh, what else? Uh, Adobe Premiere Cloning. Okay, there are so many tutorial that can be found on that. So you just have to uh, look for it, and then inshallah you will find it. Okay, that, that is for high end software, and also there are simple editing software, and usually. This software is free with the operating system as such as if you are using Windows we will get a video editor or maybe you used to heard a, a, a Windows Movie Maker okay this is simple for Windows and for Apple we do have Apple's iMovie okay these two exactly these two uh, software is, is a simple editing software and it's much more easier right, for you guys to learn but of course when the difference between simple and the high end okay are uh, in the sense of what you can do what you can uh the, the type and uh, what can you manipulate and how can you manipulate your raw material okay that's the difference in, in the basic software you can't do so much but using the high-end software and such as Premiere and Final Cut Pro okay, there are a lot of things that you can do and of course now yes, there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, mobile version of, your, of the editing software yet again, uh, it's not as uh, fully functioned as the desktop version and for example like Kinemaster, uh, Filmora what else? Uh, Adobe Premiere, uh, Premiere Rush uh, all these things are simple uh, all these, the simple entry software on the mobile version 
after we finish editing our files our video files on our, on the editor we will render the files and to become one single file and we can uh, render it uh, on various type of file such as AVI, MP4, WMV, MPEG okay, just choose according to your preference and remember after you render and let's say you need to re-edit your video okay, please make sure you do not edit the, the rendered file okay, please make sure you do not edit the, the rendered file because video codec are lossy they are lossy so when if you edit the, the rendered file the quality will drop and the quality will drop so if you want to re-edit your project please use your main the, the, the project file for example uh, if you're using Adobe Premiere the, the project file is .proj so edit that file do not edit your rendered file because why? because video codec are lossy okay and as a summary as a summary okay as a summary for this subject Okay, what are the summary for this subject for this chapter okay a digital video method is used for making and delivering video for multimedia and ccd eh? ccd or charge couple device convert the light that has been reflected from an object through the camera lens the next one is codec are used to compress a video for delivery and decompress the video for playback the fourth one, there are so many sources for digital video, but getting the right can be difficult. And it is time consuming and expensive. And the last one is, or number five, the last one is, the most video editing is now being done on computer using NLE, or non-linear editing software, such as Adobe Premiere and Final Cut Pro. Okay, so that's it for this chapter number six. I hope you guys, if you don't understand, you can play back this video. And if you have any question, don't forget or don't be afraid to contact me. You know how to contact me, right? Okay, so it's time for me to go. See you on next chapter. Bye-bye.